We are counting down the days until the NFL draft, taking a look at the draft order as it stands right now, although there have been rumors that the Dolphins now sitting at six could be considering calls from other teams looking to trade up to that position. The Dolphins would then trade down yet again. Uh, the Dolphins have had the third, the 12th, and now the sixth pick in the draft so far. But the bigger question is, who does Pete Prisco have them taking in his latest mock draft? Well, mock drafts are supposed to be fun, right? That, according to our own Pete Frisco, at the top of his article, which you can find right now on CBSSports.com. I am Amanda Gary. Yes, we are joined by senior NFL writer Pete Frisco, also our draft expert Ryan Wilson. Uh, Pete, we can't decide. Is this your third or your fourth mock draft? Uh, it's my fourth, but it's the third one we did on the, a show on because we had a preemption one one day. So it's the fourth show where Ryan gets to pick apart my mock draft, which is big difference because I've picked apart his for about uh, two months now. Exactly. Okay, well, we'll see because there are some very interesting things. Uh, everybody pay attention. The 20th pick, we'll get to that in a second. But let's start with an easy one, Pete. The Jags taking Trevor Lawrence. This is a no-brainer. Yeah, it is a no-brainer, and, and the whole hubbub about him not loving football last week because of the Sports Illustrated article was absurd, and it tells you we are in silly season. The guy's been nothing but a winner. He puts in the work. Uh, yeah, he's married. He's got other priorities in his life, but so do a lot of other great quarterbacks. I had no problem with it. He's a number one pick in the draft, and he will change the fortunes of that franchise for the next decade and a half. All right, no argument there. Likely no argument with the second overall pick Ryan Wilson. Uh, Pete has them taking Zach Wilson. Ryan, we're so focused on three and beyond. I is there any chance the Jets surprise us? Yeah, of course there is. And I think it's sort of interesting that we think it's a foregone conclusion that Zach Wilson's going number two. Had a great season in 2020, but Pete and I have both talked about this in recent weeks. There are concerns with his size, the concerns with his durability. Great arm, as I mentioned, great season in 2020. Didn't play against the best competition, but he can't do anything about that. But if you're just stacking up two players and you have Zach Wilson and Justin Fields, it certainly feels like Justin Fields would be in the conversation at two, but it feels like in the media anyway, the, the perspective is Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, and then the draft actually starts. Uh, I do think, in fact, it will be Zach Wilson. The Jets obviously haven't said anything about it. Doesn't do them any good to go one way or the other. So uh, we'll find out in, in a week's time. But Zach Wilson has, has been the default guy for, for people in the media uh, for over a month now. And uh, I get it. But I do wonder why there isn't more conversation about some of the other quarterbacks there, too. Well, we're starting it right now. We're starting the conversation. However, uh, we are going to move on to the third overall pick here. The 49ers training up to take the Dolphins picks. Now, the odds here are really interesting they changed so last week it was Mac Jones at minus 225 Justin Fields at plus 200 this week it is Justin Fields minus 125 Mac Jones plus 130 and Pete you are going with Justin Fields here yeah I just think he's a better player and I'm not so sure he's not the second best quarterback in this draft I just think that people are undervaluing what he can do and I do believe there's a much higher ceiling for Justin Fields than there is for Mac Jones Mac Jones is a good quarterback he's accurate he, he has the ability to stand in and make throws he doesn't move that well uh, or at least he wasn't asked to move that much at Alabama Justin Fields can fly if he has to run he can get outside and make throws I think he's a much better passer in the pocket than he's been given credit for and if I were the team doing the picking, and sometimes when I do these mock drafts, I put myself in that role, uh, I would take Justin Fields with the third pick if I were the 49ers. I agree with everything Pete said. I do think Justin Fields feels like he's getting sort of a bum rap, and it's, it's unclear why. Uh, he's incredibly talented and he does everything at a really high level and I say it every week when we, got, when we talk about this that if Justin Fields had returned to Ohio State a year from now we're not saying anything about him because there's nothing to really pick apart in much the same way we don't say much about Trevor Lawrence he's only played a year and a half at Ohio State but he's done it at such a high level that he certainly considers top five uh, conversation to be in that conversation uh, when I put out my top 150 last week I had Mac Jones at 11 and then I had Justin Fields at 12 and basically it was one and one a I don't think there's that much difference between them. Pete talked about the physical differences, and everyone can see that. Uh, that's as clear as day. It's just a matter of 
what does Kyle Shanahan want? It feels like Mac Jones, but we just don't know. But I do think it's interesting what is going to happen to Mac Jones now in Pete's mock draft now that he hasn't gone gone three because there are teams that have quarterback needs. Some have addressed them already in terms of trades. So this is going to be uh, fun to watch as we go through this thing. All right, so far, no major arguments here. Uh, let's get to the Falcons. And one through three have been quarterbacks. I will let you guys know who are watching. Hang on because we're not going to see another one for at least 10 picks here. Let's go to the Falcons at number four. No trades, no quarterbacks for them. Pete, you have taken Kyle Pitts out of Florida. Yeah, and, and I keep hearing around the league that, uh, you know, Arthur Blank, the owner of the Falcons, doesn't want to take a quarterback. I mean, there's been some infighting in the building you hear. Terry Fontenot, the general manager, might have been looking to take a quarterback. Arthur Smith wanted to go in another direction and play with Matt Ryan. And you hear that uh, Arthur Blank is kind of the tiebreaker, and he's leaning to keeping Matt Ryan. So the contract says they keep Matt Ryan. I think in that scenario, you draft the best player on the board. The best player on the board is Kyle Pitts. Arthur Smith loved using two tight end sets with the Tennessee Titans. You now can have Hayden Hurst uh, and Kyle Pitts on the field at the same time with Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley. Uh, good luck defending that. Uh, I think that would be a great pick for the Falcons. This is who I had the Falcons taking in my mock draft as well. Uh, it was a seven round repeat, by the way, so I'm looking forward to yours next week, that seven round mock draft. <laughs> but that's the thing. Nope. So if you're not going with a quarterback, and if you're not going to go with an offensive tackle, which could be a consideration here, but it doesn't feel like a huge need because you took two offensive linemen two years ago in the first round, then Kyle Pitts is the, the easy answer. That's the answer to the test. That's the answer that gives you 100% on the test. And, and I feel like you just bring Kyle Pitts in, and you can call him a tight end. You can call him a, an H-back. You can call him a wide receiver. You can call him a place kicker if you want. I think wherever you put him, he's going to be successful. And if Matt Ryan's your guy, and, and as Pete points out, it feels like that's the direction the Falcons are going, then put people around. Matt Ryan where he can succeed. You can circle back in the later rounds and uh, bolster the offensive line and bolster that defense. That defense has a lot of concerns there, but you're not taking a Micah Parsons here. You're not taking a Patrick Sertan here. It's just too high. The value in Kyle Pitts makes the most sense. Take him and then watch him have a ton of success and feel good about it. Ryan, you also said that seven-round mock almost killed you. Uh, we're not going to have Pete do that. <laughs> Let's go to the Bengals with the fifth overall pick. Uh, so if you go to CBSports.com, you can see all of our mock drafts uh, from all of our experts compared to right now. Now, every other mock has the Bengals taking Jamar Chase, but Pete, you are not going that way. You were going with Panay Sewell, so I'm going to start with Ryan here. What do you think about that pick? This is the pick that I would make if I were the Bengals, but the, the feeling you get, I've talked to some people around the league, that they think it's going to be Jamar Chase. I don't love it. I love Jamar Chase, but I don't love it for the Bengals because what's your lasting image of Joe Burrow? It's him writhing around in, in pain on the field after that sack against the Washington football team that ended his season early, and you have to keep him upright. So I understand uh, Jamar Chase is a shiny object who can do a lot of good things for you, but you're picking at the top of the second round, too, and Pete and I have talked about this. There are a ton of wide receivers you can get. I would take Panay Sewell. You put him in there. You have Jonah Williams. You have Riley Reef. That's 60% of your offensive line solved. You can draft another offensive lineman later in the draft for the Bengals and you're at 80% and then you're cooking with gas. You got Joe Burrow healthy. You have playmakers. You have offensive line. I think that's the direction they should go. I'm not sure they will though. All right, so Ryan agreeing with you there, Pete. Let's go to the Dolphins at six, and this is where we find Jamar Chase, Pete, in your latest mock draft. Uh, Ryan has them taking Jalen Waddle and his. That is only because in his, Jamar Chase was already off the board. So, Pete, uh, a, a good little weapon there for Tua. Yeah, it would be, it, and it, but I, I go back to the same theory on the Bengals. You got to protect the quarterback, and you know I know they drafted a couple offensive linemen last year. The Dolphins did in in, in Jackson uh, at left tackle, and also Robert Hunt, who's playing at right tackle. But Robert Hunt could be a really good right guard, I think. So. If whoever player isn't picked, I think the Dolphins will take the other one. Panay Sewell would be in play. Uh, again, I think it's going to come down to does Joe Burrow get his wish and get Jamar Chase, or do the Bengals push and take Panay Sewell? I think they went out and take Sewell. And in that scenario, I think Jamar Chase would make sense for the Miami Dolphins. They need playmakers. They need a guy outside to help Tua improve the passing game. And so I get it. He's the number one wide receiver. Every guy I talk to in the league, every single one of them says Chase is the number one wide receiver. I, I agree with that. Uh, he would be the pick for the Miami Dolphins in this scenario. All right, so both of you sort of agreeing five and six could be a toss-up between Jamar Chase and Panay Sewell. Let's go to the Lions at seven overall. Mac Jones still there. Trey Lance still there. But no Peter Prisco. You have them taking Heisman winner Devontae Smith. Explain. Yeah. And I think this is one of those cases, it 
if Justin Fields were still on the board and he's not here, he would be in play, I think, for the Lions. But as it is, I don't think he, either of the other two quarterbacks will be. I think they'll play with Jared Goff, and they'll take Devontae Smith. Look at their receiver group. It's a bad group right now. A lot of uncertainty there. They don't have a number one guy who can really stretch the field and be a productive player. So I think in this scenario, they have to take the Heisman Trophy winner. And Devontae Smith only weighs 170 pounds. He'll put on weight. And here's one thing that's kind of overlooked about him. He was a gunner on the punt team. That tells you he's tough enough to handle it. He'll be fine in the NFL. So I think the Lions take Devontae Smith. Again, Pete, I agree with what you're saying. I had Justin Fields going here only because he didn't go three. And I think if the Lions are staring Justin Fields in the face, they have to make a tough decision. If not, and they don't care about Matt Jones or perhaps Trey, uh, Trey Lance there, and they're okay, and I say okay, okay in quotation marks, with Jared Goff, then you have to surround Jared Goff with some players. You mentioned Marvin Jones is gone. Kenny Galladay is gone. I, I do wonder, though, if, if Devontae Smith weighed 185 or 190, he would be in the conversation for the number one wide receiver. I love Jamar Chase. He's my number one. Devontae Smith actually my number two ahead of Jalen Waddle, but I think NFL is so hung up on, on that weight thing, and that's a fair thing. I, I get it. There's no history of guys 6'1", 170 dominating the league, uh, but I do wonder if he weighed 15, 20 pounds more, if we would feel differently about him. That said, I don't mind the pick here at all. I think Jared Goff would love it. Gives them instant offense at, at every, all three levels uh, down the field. All right, yeah, uh, Devontae Smith weighing in at 170. Let's go to the Panthers with the eighth overall pick. Uh, Panay Sewell is already off the board, so Pete has them taking Rashawn Slater. Uh, Ryan, I, I assume you're okay with this one. Yeah, I don't think they're going to be in the quarterback mix. I mean, they just traded for Sam Darnold after the 49ers traded up from 12 to 3, and the implication there for me was that maybe they were eyeing Mac Jones. But even now that Mac Jones is still here, I do think that you have to go in another direction if you're building around Sam Darnold, even if it's for a year or two. So they take Rashawn Slater, who I love. He is one of my favorite players in this draft class. I've talked to teams that don't think he can play tackle because he has short arms, 33-inch arms. It's not short. That's sort of the cutoff uh, if you're keeping score at home. But he can play left tackle, he can play right tackle, he can kick inside to guard, he can even play center. So the versatility is there and uh, the, pa the Panthers have to get better up front. Now they can go in another direction, they get a cornerback, uh, all the wide receivers are gone so they won't target a wide receiver. Uh, but given the idea of protecting Sam Darnold, this is a great place to start. You're not going to find a player like this even in round two for an offensive lineman. So I'm fine going Rashawn Slater here, come back later and find that cornerback and defensive help. We have made it to the ninth overall pick and Mac Jones and Trey Lance are still sitting there, still with their families, whatever they're doing, all nervous-like. Uh, and the Broncos are still not going to select them, Keith Frisco. You also mentioned your article, they may be able to trade out of this spot, but you have them taking Micah Parsons. Yeah, and again, I hear from people in the league that the Broncos are going to make a deal to get Teddy Bridgewater and they will compete, let him compete with Drew Locke. Here's the fear for the Broncos. You just drafted Drew Locke, you wanna find out what he is. If you let him go, if you don't believe he's the guy, then he goes out and he becomes something somewhere else, uh, then you look really foolish. So I think they pass on a quarterback, see what they have in Drew Locke, maybe get the veteran Teddy Bridgewater in there to compete with him, and draft in a different position, and Micah Parsons would be a perfect guy to add to their defense. I don't love Micah Parsons as much as some people, but for the exercise of this mock draft, I would put him here. Uh, there is a chance he could fall down. There are some character concerns, but for the Broncos, a nice run-and-chase linebacker would be a nice addition for that defense. I love Micah Parsons uh, a little more than Pete, and he's my number one linebacker. He's not Pete's number one linebacker, I don't think, or at least it's close uh, in, the, in the talks we've had about it. But I think Micah Parsons has a chance to be really, really good. Pete talked about the maturity concerns, and that could see him drop. In fact, I had him dropping down to 17 solely because of the, the off-field issues that some teams are, are sort of worried about. I had them taking a cornerback here, Patrick Sertan. But, I mean, if Micah Parsons is here and the, 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 the Broncos, excuse me, are fine with any off-field issues that there may be, you're getting a top-five talent. Like, he has a chance to to be really, really good in a defense that's already pretty good with Vic Fangio dialing up the play. So I think that's a step in the right direction. If you're in, in, if you're fine staying with Drew Locke and perhaps Teddy Bridgewater as, as a fallback plan, then by all means, bolster that defense or perhaps even trade down. But I, I like this pick. A uh, little note on the odds here with the first defensive player drafted last week. It was Parsons at plus 140. Sertan at plus 150. This week it is flip-flop. Sertan is the favorite at plus 100 with Parsons now at plus 220. All right. Speaking
speaking of Patrick Sertan, let's go to the Cowboys with the 10th overall pick. Uh, they have their quarterback. They don't need one. So Trey Lance, Mac Jones, they sit tight here. And Pete Prisco has them taking Patrick Sertan here. Uh, what about, what do you think about this one there, Ryan Wilson, with Farley, Horn, and Sertan still on the board? Yeah, so Farley is my cornerback one until he had the back procedure a few weeks ago. And I've talked to teams that are actually worried what that means for his long-term health. He said, his camp has said he'll be ready to go by training camp, which is great. And hopefully he's fine and has a productive career. I think he's more athletic. Uh, then Patrick Sertan has more upside in terms of what he'll be five or six years from now. But Patrick Sertan, as people tell you, is, is so incredibly polished. He's enormous by cornerback standards in terms of what you look for in today's cornerbacks. And the Cowboys, this is their biggest need. I think if you probably go through all the mock drafts, uh, Patrick Sertan is probably the most popular destination in terms of landing with the Cowboys. It just makes too much sense not to happen if he's there. Rashawn Slater's gone. That could possibly be an option for the Cowboys. But I think you need to fix that defense because even with Dak coming back, I don't know if they're the favorite in that in that horrible division given all the things that Washington football team has done uh, from the end of last year until we sit here right now. All right guys hang on just a second we are going to continue on the other side of this break to talk about Pete Prisco's latest mock draft his fourth and coming up we've still, still got some quarterbacks that are waiting Trey Lance Mac Jones they're available how far do they fall in a surprise quarterback going to the Bears stick around to find out. Welcome back into CBS Sports HQ. We are going through Pete Prisco's latest mock draft. Now, he did note, let him have a little fun with this one. He has two more coming. Uh, taking a look at picks one through ten here. So, Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Justin Fields, all off the board at the very top. Uh, but no quarterbacks after that. So, we have Mac Jones, who will be there at the draft. Also, Trey Lance, uh, just sitting, very sad, not knowing their future. Pete's a mean GM. <laughs> Let's bring back in Pete Frisco, Ryan Wilson, to go through Pete's latest mock draft. We'll start with the Giants at 11. Uh, there are some rumors swirling they would consider trading down out of this one here. But Pete, you have them taking Alabama wide receiver Jalen Waddell. Yeah, and this goes against everything that I believe that Dave Gettleman believes, which is to draft big people. But in this scenario, I don't think he would draft a big guy. You know, you, you think that they got their left tackle last year, so they wouldn't take Darasaw in this spot. Uh, they need pass rushers. It's probably a little high for any of the pass rushers unless you force one of them. So I think in this scenario, they take the big play speed guy in Jalen Waddell. You know, Daniel Jones needs that in the offense. Uh, this guy is explosive. He's dynamic. I don't think there's a lot of difference uh, between him and the other two receivers in terms of the big playability. So uh, I don't think Gettleman will do this, uh, but he might get stuck and get forced to do so. That's why I think he's putting out there that he's willing to trade down. Let's go to the Eagles at 12. This is a team with a whole bunch of needs. Pete has them taking J.C. Horn. Uh, they do need a corner, Ryan Wilson. Do you like this pick for them, or would you go in a different direction? No, J.C. Horn is a really good player. Extremely physical. He's big. He's strong. He's fast. Makes plays at the catch point. Uh, a lot of pass breakups from last season at South Carolina before he opted out. And look, as you mentioned, Amanda, the Eagles have a ton of needs, and they're not going to be a receiver there at 12 for them to grab of the top three, so you're not going to overdraft a receiver, which is exactly what they did last year. In fact, there's that clip going around of a year ago, the Minnesota Vikings laughing because the Eagles passed on Justin Jefferson, allowing them to take Justin Jefferson. So they have issues there, but you're not going to be able to do anything about that at 12. So you get a cornerback, fix this defense. Uh, perhaps offensive line is a consideration here, but Pete's talked about if the guys are healthy, they have some offensive linemen uh, available and ready to play. Uh, again, that's a secondary need, whereas I think cornerback is at the top of the to-do list along with linebacker, but as Eagles fans will tell you, they never draft linebackers in the first round, which perhaps is something they could recon you should reconsider given how poorly they played last year on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, I've heard this will come down to a corner if one of those two top corners is there or an edge rusher, which is interesting. Uh, they'd like to get another pass rusher on that defense. Uh, but, you know, I don't think it's going to be a receiver. You know, there's some theories out there that they'll take the receiver to help the passing game. I think they badly need a corner. I mean, you look at their situation. Darius Slay is, is there. He's a good player. But Avante Maddox should be an inside slot corner. He'd be forced to play outside right now. So they have to get a corner. Horn would fit perfectly with the way they play defense. It makes a lot of sense. Thumbs up from both Pete. 
and Ryan Wilson there. Let's go to the Chargers at 13. Pete, in your article, uh, you say they have to get a left tackle in this draft. And sure enough, Christian Derisaw is waiting for them there at 13. And you really like this guy. Love him. I think he's going to be the best tackle in this class. I really do. And that goes against the grain of most people, most NFL people, most draft analysts. They think Panay Sewell is going to be the best guy. I don't. I think Darisaw will be. He does need to get more focused on the task. I think once he gets into a, a good NFL strength and conditioning program, he's going to be even better. He can move. He's athletic. He's tough. Uh, he just needs to finish and play with a little more nasty. I like nasty, but Panay Sewell doesn't always play with the nasty either. Uh, once he gets to the NFL and they start slapping him around a little bit, he'll be nasty enough. He's going to be a really good player. This would be a great pick for the Chargers. I can hear Ryan laughing. Okay, let's go to the Vikings at 14. And I want to quote this. Hey, if the Packers can do it to Aaron Rodgers, why can't the Vikings do it to Kirk Cousins? Pete Prisco, you have them taking North Dakota State quarterback Trey Lance. There's some growing sentiment around the league that the Vikings are strongly considering taking a quarterback. If you look at Kirk Cousins and his cap number next year, not this year, but the following year, it's 40-something million dollars. That's a lot of money for a guy who's pretty average or a little bit above average as a quarterback. So if you're the Vikings, uh, you're looking to get his replacement down the line, and Trey Lance would be a perfect pick. He could sit, he could watch, he could learn, and then take over the next year. So uh, I believe that the Vikings are going to consider it. There might even be a scenario where they move up if one of these guys falls down the line to go jump a team who they think might try and get ahead of them. So the Vikings and a quarterback is a real possibility. That's interesting. That's not something I've heard, but it does make sense on some level. I, Kirk Cousins, is, he runs hot or cold with, with Vikings fans, and sometimes he's really good, and sometimes he, he's average or slightly below average. Typically, around this time, you see in the 14th pick, you see the Vikings targeting either edge rusher, and Quiddy Pay has been a popular destination uh, in Minnesota, or someone like uh, an offensive tackle. Christian Dersaw is gone, so Elijah Barrett Tucker might also be an option, the, the offensive tackle slash guard. He'll probably play guard at the next level out of USC. But again, if you look love Trey Lance and he's sitting there and you don't expect to be picking uh, in the top five or top ten in the next two or three years you take Trey Lance I have no issue with this and look if, if your if your argument is yeah but the, the Packers did it at the bottom of the first round yeah but Jordan Love had a terrible 2019 season and I'm a huge Jordan Love homer Trey Lance is a really good football player with just a lack of experience so get him onto onto the NFL roster let him learn the playbook no need to rush him out there and there's legitimately no need in Minnesota Kurt's going to be the starter there if he feels like for at least another year and then circle back in 22 see where you are and uh hey maybe you can take Kirk Cousins to the 49ers if they don't get Mac Jones for another first round pick just parlay that out into the future yep. and oh by the way and oh by the way Kirk Cousins isn't Aaron Rodgers either if you're talking about the difference in where you draft the quarterback uh, they drafted him late Kirk Kirk Cousins is nowhere near as good as Aaron Rodgers all right we get our fourth quarterback off the board there at 14 uh Pete, Ryan is so nice to you. Like, you will sit here and you go, I hate that pick. And Ryan's like, oh, you know, that's pretty good. I like that. <laughs> oh, let's go to the Patriots at 15. We find another quarterback. And this is Ryan Wilson's guy, Mac Jones, going to the Patriots. Uh, Pete pointing out that he can take over from Cam Newton a year from now. There's our friend Brady Quinn, uh, who went a little bit further, but he knows a little bit what it's like to sit there. And you just got to wait for your name to be called. And sure enough, it will be. Uh, Ryan, what do you think about Mac Jones to the Patriots? I love the fit. By the way, that's the same haircut I had coming out of college, too, which is weird. Hard to imagine, but that, that's a true story. Uh, Brady, uh, that Brady, I'm glad Brady doesn't have that haircut anymore. Let me tell you. My gosh, that's awful. <laughs> Amanda, by the way, you're talking about me being nice and Pete not being nice. I was against putting up the Brady picture. Pete couldn't say do it fast enough. So that should give you some indication <laughs> of wh why we're different. Uh, one reason why I we're mean. different. Like the Matt Jones to, to New England thing? What's that, Pete? He said I'm he's mean. mean. All right. You know, I'm mean. That's mean. pretty well for me. <laughs> the Mac Jones. Let me talk about Mac Jones. That's my guy. It makes a ton of sense that he goes to New England. 
If they, he's there at 15, I feel like the Patriots will be doing uh, jumping jacks. Imagine Bill Belichick doing that. Uh, there may be a, a scenario where they have to trade up for him because they think that maybe he's going to be gone sooner. Uh, I know Pete's uh, bounced around the idea that who's going to pick him after if he gets past uh, seven or eight, and, and that's a fair point. But I think in, in that offense with Josh McDaniels, based on what we've seen in, in the Tom Brady era over the last 20 years, I think he has a chance to be really, really, really good because we always talk about landing spots for these young quarterbacks and how every organization isn't the right fit. I don't know if there's a better fit other than perhaps San Francisco, which will get you a lot of pushback when I say that out loud. I understand. But uh, this will be best case scenario for the, for, the, uh, for the Patriots, a team that's done a ton of free agency, and that will immediately, I feel like, challenge the Buffalo Bills again in that division. All right. We move on from you the know, quarter. Oh, go ahead, Pete. Oh, I'm sorry. It's interesting when you think about when the process kind of started and people started looking at where Mac Jones would go, they thought 15 to the Patriots would be a good spot for him. But after now the leaking out of the 49ers suddenly love Mac Jones, now this is too low. I mean, it's just weird how the process plays out. This is the right spot for him. I do hear that the Patriots also like Trey Lance a lot. And if they like Trey Lance... Uh, they're going to have their pick of their two guys right here, even if they have to move up a couple of spots to go get them. So in this scenario, the Patriots would be big-time winners, I think. I was about to say, with the way your board falls, we'll see if that's what happened next Thursday. Let's go to the Cardinals at 16. Pete, you have them taking Tulsa's Zayvon Collins. Yeah, and they need another playmaking linebacker. Remember, they drafted Isaiah Simmons. Jordan Hicks is in the final year of his contract uh, this season. And, and so why not get a guy who can play off the ball linebacker? But a lot of teams also think he can put his hand on the ground as a 3-4 rush guy. And in their defense, you know, Marcus Golden's coming back, but they could also use another guy that can be capable of doing that on third down. So I hear uh, rumblings that they really like Zayvon Collins, and this would be a, a good, solid pick for them to improve that defense. All right, Raiders at 17. This is a team uh, also with a decent amount of needs. They need help on defense, uh, but also offensive line because they saw a bunch of players depart this season on that offensive line. So Pete has them selecting offensive lineman USC's Elijah Vera Tucker. Uh, Ryan, I want to ask you about this one. Would you go with an offensive lineman or would you focus on the defense? We, we found it, Amanda. I hate this pick. Like, this is not working for me. I love Elijah Vera Tucker, but this defense, Pete, is terrible. Name a position on defense, and that's a position of need for, for the Raiders. So I would be thinking long and hard about edge rusher here. Maybe even someone like Jem uh, Jeremiah Usukoromoa. I mentioned my mock draft. I had Micah Parsons going here, and that, that might be a little easier selection over an offensive line. But, and I get that they've made some sort of weird moves along the offensive line uh, in the offseason, but this de it doesn't matter what the offensive line looks like if they're giving up 50 points a game. Derek Carr can only do so much even if he's well protected. I understand the sentiment, but I would focus on getting a Jalen Phillips here, maybe an Owusu Koromoa, virtually anybody to help that defense, which was incredibly hard to watch last year because they were so terrible. I would agree with you. Uh, 100%, I would draft on the <laughs> defensive side of the ball. It was terrible last year. But remember John Gruden. He spent so much money and on the offensive line. He had Trent Brown. He paid him. Uh, he spent a lot of money on Rodney Hudson. They went out and drafted Colton Miller. Now they paid him. He loves the offense. He's an offensive guy, and he's making the decisions. Mike Mayock is not making the decisions. Uh, and so I think that's the problem. If, if, if Normally, I'd say yes, I agree with you, but I think they got to get a right tackle. I think they will look at Elijah Vera Tucker to play on the right side. Even as much as you said, that defense was so bad last season. All right, let's go to the Dolphins again at 18. Uh, Pete has them selecting Jamar Chase at 6. And here, Pete, you're going with edge rusher Jalen Phillips. Uh, this has someone who has had medical issues, multiple concussions, before he transferred over to Miami from UCLA. So does that concern you here and why at this pick? It does concern me, and not only does it concern me, but uh, as a side note, in talking to all the guys around the league leading up to the draft, they are terrified of the medicals this year. They're not getting accurate information. They're not getting the information that they normally would get. So there's going to be a real fear of drafting a guy that's going to have medical problems down the line. So that could drop Jalen Phillips down a little bit. You know, he also had a wrist injury at one point as well. But uh, in terms of his athletic ability and, in, and the chances to get after the quarterback, I love him as a pass rusher. But the medicals are a concern. Even so, I think Miami has to address that 
position. If it's not Jalen Phillips in this spot, maybe one of the other ones, Quiddy Pay uh, or Ojolari, somebody, they have to address their edge rush. At 19, we find the Washington football team with this pick here. Uh, Pete, I am going to give you credit for this. This is a guy you are big on, and over the past couple weeks, he has been skyrocketing on a lot of draft boards, and you have them selecting Kentucky's Jamin Davis. I love this guy. I think he's going to be the best linebacker in this draft. I think he's going to be a star. He's Anthony Barr, maybe with a little tougher attitude, if you can believe that. And Anthony Barr has been a heck of a player uh, for the Minnesota Vikings. He's rangy, he's long, he's athletic, and you're seeing it right here. This pick six was incredible for a linebacker that's six foot three and a half and weighs 245 pounds. He's a heck of a player. He's athletic. He's tough. He will run to the football. And if you look at the Reds, uh, the whoops, oops, Washington football team they need uh, a playmaking linebacker on that defense they can rush the passer they're getting better in the secondary they could also go corner here but I think this guy would be too good to pass up all right I warn people to pay attention to 20 uh, Pete Prisco this is your big shock to the world you have the Bears selecting a quarterback the sixth quarterback we will now see in the first round that is Stanford's Davis Mills to the Bears at number 20 you said this would be a great move for the Bears but one that would shock the football world Ryan I want to start with you when you first saw this selection what went through your head Oh, clickbait Prisco struck again with the old Davis and Mills. <laughs> what are we doing, Pete? Come on. Here's the thing. Like in my seven round mock draft, in the second round, and picking the fifties, that's where I had Davis Mills going to the Chicago Bears. So I agree on the team, but my look, Ryan Pace is is on the hot seat. Matt Nagy's on the hot seat. So their solution is uh, let's sign Andy Dalton and let's draft a guy, overdraft a guy by about thirty spots. Now Pete might tell you, and, and I've heard similar, that there's some conversation that maybe Davis Mills or another quarterback, Helen Mond perhaps, slipped into the back of the first round because of the fifth-year option. But, Mike, the man has played 11 NFL games at Stanford as a starter. That is a huge concern, and he hasn't played at a lights-out level against Pac-12 opponents. So, yeah, I mean, the Bears could do it, and, and I, un, so, on some level, understand they need a quarterback, but my, oh, th this would be Matt Nagy and Ryan Pace would have to go undefeated next year to keep the uh, torch and pitchfork crowd from, from storming the castle because this, this is too much even for me. Okay, he's played six fewer games than Mac Jones. Six. And Mac Jones actually had... Uh, you know, six good games better probably when you look at him. He played, he was a better player than Davis Mills in college, but you're projecting. It's not what you did in college. Otherwise, Danny Werfel would have been one of the greatest NFL quarterbacks of all time. <laughs> Tim Tebow would have been a good NFL quarterback. They were great college players. That doesn't translate to the next level. Davis Mills can do everything that Mac Jones can do. Everything. He's calm. He's cool. He can stand in a pocket. He's big. Uh, he's athletic. Uh, he can move. He can throw on the move. And I think he's going to be a steal for whoever gets him in this draft. And he will be just as good, if not better, than Mac Jones on the next level. Take it to the bank. Well, talking about not a lot of starts, uh, <laughs> Pete, remind me, or Ryan, one of you, how many starts did Trey Lance have? 17. 17. All right. We're not too far off here. All right, guys. Uh, Pete, we appreciate your mock draft. We're going to continue on the other side of the break. Coming up, uh, Pete has loved Travis Etienne. So would he be flip-flopping between him and Najee Harris? I don't know. There's Chris Hassel. You'll hear from him. Continuing on with Pete Prisco's latest mock draft, and here are the teens where you had a couple of quarterbacks slide. Trey Lance goes to the Vikings at 14. Mac Jones goes to the Patriots at 15. And Davis Mills out of Stanford to the Chicago Bears at number 20. And that is where we left off. So that is where we will pick up. I'm Chris Hassel, and I'm joined by Pete Prisco and also Ryan Wilson here to check Pete's work. He's been the one doing uh, most of the dirty work in our mock drafts. He just released a seven-rounder this week ahead of next week's mock. The Indianapolis Colts are up at number 21. Pete, you haven't taken Aziz Ojolari. Why do you think this is a great fit for the way the Colts play defense? 
Well, when you look at Ojolari, I think he has as high an upside as any edge rusher in this class. And if you look at what the Colts have lost, the Nico Autry left in the free agency. They also have Justin Houston, who's probably going in free agency. And so when you look at what they lost, they need guys who can rush the passer. And this kid is the one guy that when he puts his hand on the ground can really explode up the field and can pressure the quarterback. I love him. I love his tenaciousness. I think he's tough. I think he's good in the run game. And the Colts need pass rush help. So I know they also need a left tackle in a lot of circles. They did sign a couple veterans that they feel they might be able to get by with in terms of a stopgap. Uh, but the way this one played out, I think they would take Ojolari as a pass rush help. Okay, moving on to number 22 and the Tennessee Titans selecting Quiddy Pay, the edge out of Michigan. Ryan, they added Bud Dupree. Do you think they should also add another edge here? Absolutely, and the question is going to be, and Pete and I talk about this every week, which edge rusher, because these guys are going to start going off the board around 15, 16, 17, and that's where Pete had his first guy going in Jalen Phillips. Could Quiddy Pay be the first one off the board as the edge rusher? Sure, Ojolari could be too, as, as well as Phillips. But the issue is, and Pete notes this, the Titans are terrible at, at rushing the pass. They had 19 and a half sacks last year, and that's just not sustainable. They got Bud Dupree. He's coming off the ACL injury. And I think what Pete wrote on the website uh, about the – about uh, Quiddy Pay going here, it says it all. If you're going to beat the Chiefs and Bills in the AFC, you have to knock the quarterback down. It works, Chris, and I think that's right. It works. So knock the quarterback down, beat the Chiefs, beat the Bills. Quiddy Pay helps you get to that point. Yeah, it didn't work uh, until the Super Bowl when the Bucks were able to do that against Patrick Mahomes. Moving to the Jets now at number 23 and Pete Frisco's latest mock. Pete, you had him taking Zach Wilson, number two, and now going from quarterback to cornerback in Greg Newsom the second. Yeah, and they have a lot of needs, clearly, and, and so they can go in a bunch of different directions here. But I think the value uh, and the need kind of match up here. Greg Newsom's an interesting player. He's a long corner. He would step in and start right away. And if you look at the Jets' cornerback situations, situation, it's not very good. So uh, I really do think, uh, you know, you get a long corner in there in that defensive scheme, I think it would really work. Uh, we know what they want to play. They like to play. They're going to play a lot of that, uh, you know, cover three defense that Sala likes to play and has played in his career. And so a long athletic corner uh, would really fit what they want to do on defense. Okay. Mike Tomlin got a contract extension this week. The Pittsburgh Steelers are up at number 24. And Pete, I'm surprised here because I know you like Travis Etienne more than Najee Harris. Why do you have Harris uh, going to the Steelers here? Because I think the Steelers will like it. I've heard they like Najee Harris a great deal. I think that's the kind of back they're leaning to take. And a guy who can, you know, kind of pound it between the tackles a little bit, but also catch the ball out of the backfield. Where I think ETN's more of an air back. A guy who can, you know, really beat you with the, in the passing game and also with the long runs. I don't think the Steelers are exactly that type of team. In fact, they want to get more to being a pounded team. They couldn't run the football last year. The offensive line was bad, and that's why an offensive lineman is also in play here, but I think in this scenario, I keep hearing more and more that they want to get it back, and I think Najee Harris probably fits with what the Steelers want to do more than ETN does. Okay, and ETN is the favorite, barely to be the top running back off the board over Travis ETN, third in the country in rushing last season. To number 25, and it's the Jacksonville Jaguars again, Ryan, after Pete had him taken, as everybody has, uh, Trevor Lawrence at number one. Has him going wide receiver, Kadarius Toney out of Florida. Is wide receiver a must here, in your opinion, for the Jags? And it's pretty high up on the to-do list, Chris. And if you wanted to go in another direction here, you certainly could. I had them taking Caleb Farley, the cornerback who's going to slide down the draft boards, most certainly. Uh, but that's a risk. We don't know how healthy he's going to be. So if you take a wide receiver here, then you can address the other needs with the two first, two second round picks you have high coming up uh, once the, you get to round two there. But Kadarius Tony gives Trevor Lawrence a much needed weapon. Yes, they have Lavisca Chanel. Yes, they have DJ Shark. They need more out of their wide receivers and a quarterback who can consistently get. To the ball, and it shouldn't be the case that the pass catchers you had at Clemson were better than the ones you're going to have at the NFL. So Kadarius Tony is a really good player. He's a, an example of a player who came back and made himself a lot of money uh, returning to school, had a really good 2020, really good senior bowl, and he's basically a running back with the ball in his hands, except he threatens all three levels. I love I love this pick here, uh, and if you don't get him here, he might even be there at the top of round two, but it makes sense for what the Jaguars want to do with Trevor Lawrence. Yeah, Pete Prisco keeps saying the Jags need speed. 
need speed and more speed, and he certainly fits that bill. Uh, moving on to the Browns at number 26, Pete. Obviously, the, uh, they went out and they got Jadevian Clowney to go opposite Miles Garrett. But you're going inside here as well, an interior defensive lineman, Christian Barmore out of Alabama. Remember, they released Sheldon Richardson. Larry Okunjobi left as a free agent. Uh, they are getting Andrew Billings back after he opted out last year. And they do have a young player that they like in Jordan Elliott. But if you can get a guy like Barmore to play him inside, I think that would really help the interior of that defense. The concern with Barmore is he didn't always play hard. I mean, he was much better in the big games, which tells you that he could turn it off and on. He's going to have to turn it on every week in the NFL. Uh, so there are some concerns from that standpoint. If he were uh, a little bit more driven and focused in, in terms of what he did week in and week out and showed the consistency, he'd be a higher pick because this is a lean class for defensive tackles. So I think the Browns grabbing him here would be a nice move for them to help that defense. All right, six more picks to go in Pete Prisco's latest mock draft. He has, I believe, two more coming next week. So we'll wait for those. But we're going to find out. Are we going to have another running back? Is ETN going to make it in? We will have another wide receiver. And where does Caleb Farley end up? Finishing up Pete Prisco's latest mock draft here in round one, looking at 21 through 26. Najee Harris to the Steelers, even though Travis Etienne was on the board, just feels like uh, the Steelers really like Harris and would be a, a great fit there in Pittsburgh. And Kadarius Toney to the Jacksonville Jaguars at number 25. So let's move to number 27. That's where we find the Baltimore Ravens. And Pete, I know a, a lot of mocks from Ryan Wilson have had uh, the, the Ravens going wide receiver, but you do not go wide receiver here. You go safety in Trevon Morig. Why? <laughs> Well, when you look at the back end of their defense, the cornerbacks are outstanding, but I still think they need a game changer on the back end. I mean, they, they have Chuck Clark. Remember, they tried to make it work with Earl Thomas. It didn't work. They need a guy who can go sideline to sideline, and this kid is the top safety in the draft, and I, don't, I think there's a real drop down uh, from him to the next highest ranked safety. So I think in this scenario, the Ravens, yeah, they could use a pass rusher uh, off the edge, losing Judon and Yannick Ngakwe, but, and they could also use another the receiver, but I think here they take the best available player, and that's uh, Trevon Morig. Okay, to number 28 then, and the New Orleans Saints, and it's Caleb Farley uh, going to the Saints, the, the cornerback who, who could have been the number one cornerback off the board before some issues, medical concerns, back surgery. Ryan, do you think he's going to be around here, and, and if he is, how far might he slide? No, yeah, I've talked to teams that are concerned, concerned to the point where that he's not going to be a top 10 pick, and then they're making decisions at the bottom of round one, the top of, of round two even, should we take a flyer on him. But I love the idea of him going to the Saints. It's a low-risk uh, situation at the bottom of round one. They need cornerback help, and you're, if healthy, getting the best cornerback in the class as opposed to the third or fourth best linebacker or even if you go edge rusher, the fifth or sixth best edge, as, best edge rusher. So I would be willing to take a flyer on Farley here, and the Saints need help at cornerback. So I, I I like the move here by Pete. Okay, let's move on to the Green Bay Packers, and it's a wide receiver here, and I know Ryan and a lot of mocks, you had him taking another Moore, uh, the Moore out of Purdue, Rondale Moore, but Pete, you have him going Elijah Moore. Why Elijah over Rondale here for the Packers? Well, I think he was a little bit more productive. He played more football, and, and I think they're comparable. The problem with Rondell Moore is he's only five foot seven. Now, for me, it wouldn't scare me away. Uh, I think he's going to be a dynamic playmaker if a team gets creative with him, and we know Matt LaFleur can get creative. I just think right now, as they're constructed, I think Elijah Moore fits with what the Packers want to do better. They need to get a big play threat in the middle of the field. I think Elijah Moore can do that from the slot. All right, let's move on to the Buffalo Bills then at pick number 30. And they already had Tredavious White, one of the best corners in the game. Pete has him taking another cornerback, though, Asante Samuel Jr. And Pete, I'll let you go at it again because you love this guy. He was on your better than team. Yeah, I just think he's NFL ready. He's been studying the position his entire life. His father was a great cornerback in the NFL, and he's following in those footsteps. If he was an inch taller, two inches taller, he'd be a top 15 pick. And, and I think teams are underestimating how good he's going to be on the next level. I love him. I think he's going to be a star corner in the NFL. Okay, let's move to the Chiefs then. The runner-up last season, second to last pick in the first round at number 31. Ryan Pete has him taken Jeremiah Owusu Koromoa. Is he a linebacker or a safety in your opinion? 
That's the question. You talk to some teams and he's a safety. You talk to other teams and they're fine with him being a dimebacker. So the Chiefs need linebacker. They need safety. And Pete wrote about it in his mock draft on the website that make him have him take the Daniel Sorensen hybrid role and just take over that area of the field. I think he has a chance to be really good. It may take some time for him to grow into that role, much like we saw Isaiah Simmons a year ago. But the athleticism, what we saw on the field at Notre Dame was off the charts good. I love this pick here at 31. Okay, and then at 32, you have the Tampa Bay Buccaneers who are seemingly bringing back everybody. So, Pete, how'd you go about making this final pick? Another edge rusher. Jason Pierre-Paul's not a kid anymore. He's had a great career. He's still productive, but he's coming to the end. You still need to replace him. I think Boogie Basham is a big-time pass rusher who the NFL people love a lot more than the draft analysts do. And I think if you're the Bucks here in this spot, uh, I think you would consider quarterback if Davis Bills were here. You could consider running back, but I think they go edge rusher at number 32. Okay, Pete, two more mocks to go. Are you ready? You ready for the draft? It's coming, baby. I'm ready. All right. I'm ready. <laughs> Week from Thursday is the first round. We've got your coverage. Uh, our CBS Sports HQ team ha will have you covered Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. We'll have details on that uh, next week. Here's how Pete Prisco's mock finished up. No Travis Etienne. How about that? Pete loves Etienne, but does not have him going in the first round as the Packers taking Elijah Moore, the wide receiver, uh, at number 28. Get your daily NFL fix with Will Brinson and the Pick 6 crew. Latest episode, uh, ranking the draft prospects at running back. Najee Harris ahead of Travis Etienne. Do you want a sports network that delivers everything that matters about the game? The highlights, the picks, the instant analysis, no yelling, no fake debates, no politics. Hit the subscribe button and never miss a moment.